your earliest memory of music and the sax and do you recall was there a moment when you realized yeah i like this this is what i want to do okay uh my earliest say that again my earliest uh memory of music and the sax okay my earliest okay my earliest memory of it was you know my dad played so uh, originally i played drums at first now, the reason I played drums was because uh, my dad took me to see Sonny Rollins play. He drove the band. He drove the bass player, which his name was Larry Ridley, and he drove the piano player, whose name was Albert Daly. So uh, here I am backstage, and Jim Hall was on this gig. It's documented. This was 1972 at the University of Connecticut in stores. And uh, it's ironic that I have the flyer from that. Sonny Rollins saved all of his, uh, all of his, a lot of his stuff, and he put this in an archive that's in Harlem. So my point is that you know Sonny Rollins had a major influence on me. Even you know, like my father drove me. I was hanging around backstage when the show was over. I went and got on the drums and started playing the drums. So Sonny uh, came out of the dressing room and looked on the stage, and he said. Who's on the drum? So it was me. So he told my father to get me a set of drums, which I got a little small set, but I didn't like the drums because I didn't have the full set, the, the whole four piece, five piece, the cymbals and all that. So I played the trumpet for maybe about a year and I studied. I was okay, but my brother played trumpet. So I didn't want to play what my brother played, my brother Charles. So uh, one day he brought home an alto sax and he said, you want to try it? I tried it. And I put the mouthpiece on, and the first note I blew came out. So that was when I realized, okay, I like the sax. My father played saxophone, but yeah, he wasn't trying to make anybody a saxophone player. But when he brought home the alto, I tried it. I liked it. And that, that began my mind of wanting to play music. Mm. Now, the other question you said, because I, I, I uh, know how that... Okay, so do you recall, was there a moment when you realized, yeah, I like it, this is what I want to do? Yeah, um, I used to play in a band with some cats in the neighborhood. One of my man, Tony Paris, I forget the name of the band, but Barry Eastman was on keyboards. Tony was the bass player. And Tony was the guy that came to the club. Remember that big guy I had him yes. hanging around me? Yeah. Yeah, Tony, that same guy. <laughs> well, the same guy. He, See, lives, like, he lives in Sydney, up. right? No, he lived in Brooklyn, uh, New York, Bro the brother of the big bodybuilding guy. Yeah, yeah, I remember. With. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. But, but what was uh, he doing in Melbourne at that stage? He came to see me play, man. Wow, wow. Right. He came to see me play. Tony's yeah. that kind of guy. He came to Nice, France when I played with Clifton Anderson at the Nice Jazz Festival. Mm -hmm. He came to Shanghai when I was playing in China for this club called CJW. But um, he was in the band that we had as kids. I forget the name. He's going to kill me because he, he knows the name. But... uh. I played a solo on the saxophone and I was about 16 mm. and there was so, always some girls hanging around. I wasn't even into girls. I was into basketball and the music. I lived in a house with my brothers and sisters, girlfriends and all that. Just, that just wasn't the deal. But I was, I had, you know, I could, when I saw some a pretty girl, I wasn't like stupid, but I played this solo on this song, man. And the girls looked at me so different. It's like I, I saw what a, I guess what a woman shows when she likes somebody, you know. You can tell when a woman likes you. You've, we've met enough women. You know when somebody you got to work on. Then you know when you meet one that actually looks like she likes you. 
Well, they had an expression of like, wow, that's really nice. So I saw the power at about 16 years old of what playing an instrument or the effect that it had on people that liked what you did. So mm. I said, man, I think I need to be doing, I told myself really kind of, I think I should be doing this. You know? <laughs> you know, not that I was even into girls. It just yeah. was like, it just was like, wow, that's different. It, that was the first time I got a reaction from a woman. I guess It's the perks of the job. Very good perks, as you know. Yeah. You know. So, yeah, that's an interesting... Uh, so how old would you would have been back then? When, when Was that your teenage years? I was about 16 when that happened. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I was 16. I okay, remember. but you, you, you already had, what, eight years of uh, under your belt, like working with your dad and travelling and knowing what, you know, the concept of a band means and all that sort of stuff, right? Oh, well, he had taken me to see Sonny Lawrence play at this club in New York called The Bottom Line. And then after going to that concert, that really was a, I got to see how people reacted to me. Mm. I think every parent should take their kids to concerts. You know, like most parents take their kids to basketball games and baseball games, soccer. My dad took me to jazz clubs, man. <laughs> and it was different. It was a whole yeah. other, and I was a kid, you know? Yeah. And I look at kids, cats that bring their kids to clubs today. And sometimes I get a little irritated, but then I say, yo, Eric, that was you and your dad. Mm. He used to bring you to clubs. Yeah. So I saw adults. I saw how people interacted. I saw how women or even men would react, react to music as a kid, you know. And uh, I, I realized this, this ain't a bad life. You, you, you don't start till eight or nine at night. You mm. don't get up in the morning to go to work. Your gig starts at night. So yeah. I saw that as like, wow, this could be a... Uh, this would be an interest, a interesting way to live. Sure. You touched on your father, uh, Charles Jolly White. Uh, used to hang out with. You mentioned also that he used to hang out with some fantastic musicians like Charlie Parker, Thelonious Monk, Dexter Gordon, Gary Bartz, Big Nick Nichols, um, Wilbur Ware, and Dizzy Gillespie, just to name a few. And of course, uh, your godfather, Sonny Rollins. What was it like to be around these legends at such an early age? You know, I talk to cats about this all the time. You know, uh, as you being a guy who works with all these great musicians that come to the club and all different genres, as you've met everybody, because you were the guy, you, you run the sound, they got to deal with you. Mm. Uh, it just amazed me. Because when I was around them, you know, your father is your father in the house. Discipline, this and that, you know. But when my father was around these guys, I observed a different person. And I don't think my sisters ever really got to see. Maybe my other brother. But he just was, these men were so different. I never, I could, and you know how kids are. You remember when you hear people saying stuff. I can't even recall vulgarity being used mm. ever in their presence, whether they used it and realized that a kid was in the room and they didn't use it because they could talk so intelligently. Yeah. Uh, it just showed me a uh, different kind of energy, a different kind of attitude. And uh, I just saw my father as a different guy, you know? Yeah. And um, I really wish I could direct your listeners to the, there's a video that uh, a cat put online that shot Sonny Rollins talking about my dad. And uh, it's not online now. I had thought I was going to, it was on YouTube, but it's not there. I'm going to try to find out if I can get it put back up there. But yeah. in this video, uh, the guy asked Sonny about me. He says, well, Eric, I knew me and Eric's father, his father was my best friend. And that he was a great player. He said, but he didn't get a chance to do what he could do because of his family. You know, he put his family first mm. because he didn't like his, he didn't, he wasn't raised by his dad. So he didn't like, he wanted to, my mother always told me he wanted to have a family. And mm. uh, once he decided it was five of us, he couldn't go on the road and play music. And he had opportunities. Kind of Sonny was saying, yeah, he, he was a good player, but he, he, he did it. He, he, he gave it up for his family, but he told, he said to Sonny, 
But I think Eric is going to take, Eric is going to get into it. He, he mentioned that. But this was on Sonny saying it, he's talking, you know. But I don't have, have it, but people saw it. It was online. But, you know, just being around him, when I saw he, when he was, I saw that he wanted somebody to play music and everybody in my family kind of, you know, it's like, it was just, they didn't want to do it. it. It took discipline. You had to practice. You had a rule. You had to practice an hour a day. Or you can't go outside and play football, jump rope, whatever, whatever you wanted to do. You had to practice an hour a day or write out your music scales, mm. like the C scale, the D scale, the E scale, the F. So as a kid that wanted to make him happy and go outside, I just started doing it. I started memorizing it, which is what he wanted us to actually, he was sublim subliminally teaching us to memorize the scales. Because once I started doing it, you couldn't go out unless you wrote them out. I wrote them out and would go outside. And then before, you know, I, it was nothing for me to write out 12 the scales. Mm -hmm. But uh, he just was a different, a different kind of energy when he was around these guys. And they were very animated, very cool, and very respectful. That's what I, what I remember. You know. mm -hmm. So you've performed all over the world, including Europe, Russia, China, Thailand. Do you have any experiences with culture shock man you know I, I i i love to investigate the culture as you know mm. um well i can't say as you know but i'll say everywhere i go i learn to speak to the people in their own language wow so uh in shanghai it's ni hao ni jing ti hao ma in Russia, it's Privet Kagdila Korasho. In Japan, it's Genki Deska. Domo Arigato Gizamista. In Italy, it's. Uh, uh, I'm forgetting. I'm forgetting my Italian. Oh, man, I'm forgetting. It's going to come back to me. Uh, German is Donkey Shane. That's like hello or something. Uh, in uh, Slovakia, it's Ahoy. In, like Slovakia near Prague and Bratislava, it's Ahoy. And a lot of other stuff that I learned, I can't really say, I wouldn't want to say. Uh, <laughs> in Lebanon, it's um, Kev Halik, Hamdila, you know, Shokran, which is thank you. Okay. It's always good to learn to say thank you. Yeah. You can't lose with thank you. That's it. And, um, <laughs> Malaysia is, what is it in Malaysia? A Apa Kappa. Wow, that's Apa an array of languages. Yeah, and then in Thailand, it's Sawadee Cup. So that's one of the things I've kind of pride myself on. I try to, in Australia, in Australia is, hey, mate, hey, bloke. Yeah. Right? Uh, uh, you know, of course, the word shag is involved. In a little bit, you know, some Australia. That to me, it's like it's not other English. It's not it's English, but it's different. You know, cheeky bugger. You know, little stuff. Yeah. I just try to. I, I like to investigate the culture. So, so in that amount of time, I don't know how many languages that was, but I, everywhere I go, I try to learn something at least to say how you doing. Yeah. You know. Yeah. No, that's true. I, I've done that myself actually when I've gone overseas. Right. It's uh, in China, it, I learned to I, le I learned to count, you know. Yeah, I learned to count the money or, or numbers. Mm. That's one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. that was up to ten. Then uh, ten is uh, she, e, she, ah, she, san, she, z, she, wu, she, lil, she, chi, she, ba, she, jo. That's Asha is twenty. Asha, you just keep repeating the same word, but mm. you. So 20 is, is uh, uh, Asha, 3 is Sasha, 4 is Zisha, Wu is 50 is Wusha, but it's E-R-San, 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 Zu, Wu. You just keep saying it over and over till you get to e by. So it's e by e, e by R, e by San, e by Z, e by Wu, and you get a thousand, that's Chen, Chen, Chen E, Chen R, Chen. So I learned this stuff, man. I would sit around not just bugging out i tried to learn something when i would be in these countries mm. but you know. was there like anything 
out of any of these countries where you've gone, holy shit, this is something different to me. You know, this is something. I mean, we're all human, but on when we're all we all yeah. connect on that level. But was there anything culturally that just gave you a an, a, an, a really uh, unusual opening, you know, to the culture side of things, or was it something that you could, that you did couldn't you couldn't quite grasp with the culture, or? Uh, I would say maybe Haiti. Okay. Haiti, Haiti was totally. It was almost frightening, man. Yeah, right. Uh, it was not great. The food was great, the audience was great, but the wor- the way that country is, mm. you know. It's a lot of things that you just can't be out at night. It's a lot. You can't be by yourself. Uh, it's best to be go home at a certain time unless you're with somebody. And even then, you have to watch. It's, you have to keep your eyes on so many places. For instance, I'll just say this: when I when we were leaving, uh, my ticket said that, I'm, that my flight was about six o'clock in the evening. But the guy that brought me there, his ticket was for one o'clock. We all went to the airport like we all going home. And when I looked at my ticket and it said six o'clock, I said, bro, you're not leaving me down here for six more hours. I refuse to, uh, we, you got to talk to that lady at the ticket or we got to switch. So you speak this language, you know how to deal with these people. Mm. I'm not going to be the only guy down here American, black American. I don't speak Patois and I don't speak French. Uh, si vous play and all that, you know, merci beaucoup. That shit ain't gonna do me much of nothing. Uh, <laughs> you gonna have to let me take your seat. Yeah. Cause I'm gonna tell you right now, if you leave me down here, I, I don't want to say, I, I'm not, you know, we, this is a public forum. I, I'm gonna tell you the, what the language I said to him. But basically, I, we both got on the plane. Okay. And I was very adamant, Pete. Mm. So, not to show disrespect to that country, but I'm telling you now, that, that was one that I, I'm glad I saw it because you hear about shit on the news. Mm. See, when you actually go to these places and see how the life is, mm. you can have a better understanding. And, you know, it's third world. It just, it's just locked. They're lacking so much. The robes are not paid. There's no street lights. You know, it's a heavy, it's a heavy visual. Mm. The people are very nice, but when, you can't just go out, man. Yeah. You're taking your life at in, 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 in risk. That's an island, isn't it, off America somewhere? Yeah, yeah it's, uh One side of it is the Dominican Republic. The other side is Haiti. Okay. So that's Near in the, Florida. So, I'm about an hour from Miami, going south, I think. Okay, so that's like the West Indies, is it, or...? Yeah, but not really. Okay. No, it's, it's more okay. like uh, I'm not sure how, what I would call it, but the West Indies is Jamaica, yeah, Saint Croix, Saint Kitts, Antigua. It's beautiful there. You you, have, you got some crime in Jamaica, but I I played in a reggae band, so I've been to Saint Croix, I've been to Antigua, mm. I've been to Saint Kitts. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, it's the shit you see in the movies when people are vacationing. Yeah, the water's baby blue, and you get. Seafood right out the water. It's beautiful. Yeah. Uh, but Haiti is just, it's just so. Uh, so they got the, they, 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 they've got the voodoo shit going on, haven't they? In, right, uh, in right. Uh, Haiti. They got a, and, and, and I saw something, I was at somebody else and there was something in a tree. It looked like a piece of fruit. He said, that's the thing that they take and they make the, this drink. Like you could be in a bar and this is not applying to all the people. This is applying to people that are into this. You could like turn your head and somebody will pour that shit in your glass and you turn around and you may drink it. They, supposedly when you try to walk, they, you look like you need help. And they they say, oh, you okay? You all right? <laughs> Let me get you some air. And then when your ass hit that air, that's it. They, you just got kidnapped. Wow. When you wake up, you know, this is true. This has happened to people. So I don't want to put nobody down. Like I didn't see it happen. I was in Haiti. These are stories I heard. And I remember I said, what's that on the tree? And the brother said, Oh, that's the, um, something that they uh, they use to, you know, they use that to, uh, you know, it's a thing that can mess you up, man. Yeah. So I just didn't want to be, you know, a couple of times the power went off, you know, and it goes off and then you got to wait. So you if you win your room, you know, it's just heavy country, man. But 
that was one that uh, I'm glad I, you know, sometimes you just have to go through life and see things. Yes. I didn't have any regrets, but it definitely was not, not, not the norm for me to travel. So, and perform so you practice. performed there um, for a week or? We rehearsed for about three or four days, and then we had a show on either Friday or Saturday. Okay. I was playing with a band called Skasha, which is a big Haitian band, and there's Tabu Combo. Okay. So it's like, it was a festival. It was a nice little gig. But I just wasn't ready for the, I just couldn't go. You know, most time you go to places, you go out every night, you yeah. hang around, you go. Like we went to that bar almost every night. You remember the bar near the club? Yeah. You don't hang out in Haiti. Yeah. If you do, you better speak the language and know the people. Mm. Don't be a foreigner. It's just, it's just not something to advise. Man. Sure. You played in Australia. How do jazz clubs and jazz scene in Australia compare to back home in America, and what makes a good jazz club? Well, first, you need to have a guy like you working the sound. <laughs> Thanks, man. Without the goddamn sound, <laughs> what's the point, right? Yeah. But yeah, they need a Pete Camarelli. Come, how am I saying it? Camilleri. Right? Camilleri. You got to yeah. get a Pete. You got. If it ain't Pete, somebody that has the ability, the skill set, and the knowledge. Mm. I love the Australian, you know, I I got a lot of Australian friends, Sean, uh, Waylon, um, Swanee. Yeah, my man. Yes, uh, Swan. What a beautiful cat, man. Mm. Right. The Swan. What's his first name? I'm sorry. Andy Swan. Andrew. Andrew, Andrew. Swan, my brother. Yeah. Yeah, I met him in New York, man. He was working the kitchen. He was such a cool cat. But yeah, that's why I learned all the cheeky bugger and shag stuff from those okay. cats, you know. <laughs> then there's Nick Hampton. Yeah. Cool, cool as ice, Nick Hampton. Um, are these musicians um, Australian musicians? With, hmm? Are these Australian yeah, musicians that have have um, yeah have have they lived in America and that's where you met they him? He lived there. He lived in America. Yeah. Yeah, they, I would see him at Smalls. Mm. Uh, then you, you, a guy came through. He was hanging out. He was the doorman. He was working at Smalls too. Uh, guitar player. Forget his name, man. Magnuson. BJ. Nah. Not BJ. Uh, but he was a nice cat. He was working at Smalls. He had left when the pandemic got too heavy. He couldn't stay in. Okay. But um, yeah, uh, Australian people are very cool, man. And y'all got your own world, your own vibe. Mm -hmm. They dig jazz. Some good players come out of Australia. So mm -hmm. really, I learned that when I was in China because a lot of people go to China, Shanghai. Mm -hmm. they, a lot of Australians have come to those cities, you know. Yeah. But uh, yeah, good musicians, man, um, and cool people. That makes the club. The, what makes the club is having uh, the audience respect who the artist is. It helps when the audience knows who these artists are as mm. opposed to they just come into the club to hear a band and they go to the club for the dinner. You know, yeah. it really helps when you know who the cat is or has some of his records. Mm. That's but, right. um, you know, that helps. Yeah. I was surprised to sell out the, the two nights. I think I sold out. That was shocking me because I never been to Australia. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, uh, know that jazz is uh, popular in certain places, so I'm assuming they read something about me that they like. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I went to the desk before we played, I asked the lady the first night, so how did I do? She said, oh, you sold out. Yeah. You know, the first area of the big part. Well, most of the people going to sit in the front, so yeah, it felt good to have that, you know, know that I'm playing to a sold-out house. Absolutely. How has live music scene over there handled the pandemic, and what do you think will be the long-term consequences of 2020. Wow. Oh, man. Uh, everybody's handling handling, handling it, uh, I guess, the best way they can. This is new for, I'm sure, I'm sure for you as well, mm. you know. Um, we make our money at night in a club with a bunch of people buying liquor and cursing and talking, you know, smack. Yeah. And uh, you realize when it's gone, wow, this was my money. This was not just 
Yeah. This wasn't just something to do. You know, I, I got I got paid for this. Yeah. So uh I did a couple of live streams. They're okay. Uh a lot of cats are going back to play on the street, which mm -hmm. is interesting. Like, you know, guys are meeting up playing in, in the park and certain yeah. places in Manhattan. Um, Smalls fought through all the, the muck and the mire and somehow got to be still open because he had a live streaming set, set, set up, taking donations. So mm -hmm. there's two clubs, at least one was Smalls. He had Mesro open too. And a couple of clubs like Smoke, they're doing live streams. Uh, Birdland just started a little something. Places are trying to adapt, mm. you know. Going forward, I just don't know, man. Uh, you know, I was occupied. Um, I was fortunate that I recorded a record this year. Uh, I mean, last year. From like maybe April to October, I was doing all the set setting up, arranging who to get, making phone calls, mm -hmm. talking with the pre president of the label, discussing, you know, budgets and studios, and uh, I wound up having to focus on that. So I didn't get too caught up in what everybody else was doing, because mm -hmm. of this record, I got some great musicians, Jeff Tane Watts on drums, Donald Vega on piano, uh, Theo Croker, young man that I've been knowing since he was 22, mm -hmm. trumpet player that I played a lot in China. You know, I, I went to China twice playing for him. He's a lot younger than me, but uh, he, his, his latest album was nominated for a Grammy. And uh, it just was, it, it was time for me and him to record. I've been knowing Theo for a while. We used to play a lot in China. Mm -hmm. hung out he taught me some of this chinese that i learned but uh yeah i got him i got chris lowry which is a young guy who's new on the scene uh i'm just saying their names just real quick makai boone is the son of a drum a bass player named mike boone mm -hmm. makai is 14 years old you gotta hear this guy wow his dad is playing bass so it's like father and son but they're good they play on a, cer a certain level and i got a special guest singer uh, her name is samara joy mcclendon she won the Sarah Vaughn uh, vocal competition in 2019. Mm -hmm. But my point is that that kept me so focused trying to maintain my uh, practice regimen and working on songs and figuring out what I'm going to record on the album. So I kind of, after November and December, which is just past, I've been focusing on the album, trying to get it finished. Half of it is mixed. Mm -hmm. I'm working on the other half now. So. I was fortunate that I have something to take my attention away from trying to get gigs because you can't, it's just so weird, man, with the social distancing and the mask, you know, we, we, this is our, our careers are, we have to interact with people, mm. you know, so how is it going to come back? I'm really wondering yeah. to the same place it was mm. because it's based on us selling points out or people packing in, buying as many tickets. Yes. So we got to get back to complete normalcy for that to happen. Yeah. And the way this is evolving, even with the vaccination, how long is, you know, what's this transition to? We can now walk around and be able to hug. Hey, man, give you a hug and mask. You know, don't have to wear a mask. I don't have the answer, man. I'm hoping for the best. Yeah. But it's definitely been an interesting year and a half so far. Yeah, we're, we're um, it is. And, um, at this point in time in Melbourne, we don't we haven't had it as bad as what you've experienced in America. N nothing near what you guys have experienced. However, it has a, impacted on us, um, and the music industry has been impacted quite significantly. Oh, man. And uh, like birds, you know, we haven't even opened up yet. You know, we're, we're still waiting to hear when we're going to open up and wow. things are going to look very different in context of that club. Um, we won't be doing five days anymore. We'll just be doing Fridays and Saturdays. So wow. not only have uh, we've gone down in money and, and you know, uh, days of work, um, but, yeah. Right. So it's really impacted on us quite significantly and uh, 
whilst there's other things opening up and there's a lot of other opportunities in the industry, but um, yeah, it's uh, it's a very competitive market because all of a sudden there's a lot of people looking for work. Right, Every, and everybody's out of work. That's right. That's right. Everybody, you know. That's right. What, what do you think of the uh, next generation of music co- musicians coming through the ranks? Uh, do you see yourself as a mentor, and do you think the future is in good hands? Wow, you know that's a good question, and you know from the the gentleman that I'm interacting with, people like some of the guys I mentioned, uh, Theo Croker, very interesting young man as an artist. Uh, he's going to be fine. He's learned some lessons, and he we talk a lot about a lot of different things, not just music, like a lot of subjects we speak about. Oh, man, this cat will call me 2 o'clock in the morning sometimes, <laughs> you know, and we just, but but I, I enjoy the, the, sh- the sharing of the knowledge because mm. I'm learning too, you know. Yeah. Uh, Casa Overall, who you may mm. know of. I do you know, know Casa, Casa, right. Yeah. Yeah, he played with he, he played he, he played um with uh, Carmen yeah, Lundy. Uh, right. Yeah. Right. He was uh the album was nominated for a Grammy. They didn't win. Oh, but Casa's on her album. Yeah. Yeah, Casa. We talked about playing in Birds. Yeah. He came there. Yes, he did. But yeah, I'm, yeah, he was a very hip cat man. He did some. He's working on a project with me. We're Beautiful. shooting a video. Yeah. So that's yeah. I'm looking at guys like Casa. Uh, Chris Lowry, who a lot of cats don't know, he's on. He's a come. He's an up and coming trumpet player. Mm. And when you hear him on this record, you will definitely be impressed. I'll mm. say that. Uh, everybody that is is hearing him on a particular track is asking me, "Who's that on trumpet?" Because mm. he has his personality, and he has a lot of power. I Man, he plays very strong and confident. And he's kind of new on the scene. But I met him when he was about eighteen or nineteen, and Brooklyn when I used to run these jam sessions. I met a lot of young brothers. Um, there's a young kid, 14, on my record. He's going to be great because he of the learn the way he's been taught by his dad and this, you know, very traditional. His dad used to play with Buddy Rich, yeah. uh, you know, and but different people. But Buddy Rich, Ben Vereen, he learned a lot of great things from them. But he's teaching his son a very different way of learning this music like which is basically on the bandstand mm. so and then there's samara you don't know her yet she has a record coming out and she'll be on my record she sings amazing she's gonna there's some very interesting younger people that it's going to take time unfortunately this music is your life now how how they how they maneuver through their lives mm. as they go through these stages will be on them yeah because it's a lot you have to give up you have to sacrifice if that's what you're trying to obtain. See, I grew up, as I was telling you, once I saw that my dad, when I when I actually realized, so you mean you gave up your life so we could be successful. Yeah. And you haven't been to all, the, all these countries that you could have played in from my uh, information that I was given about how he was. And then I got to say to myself, okay, let's say your father is... Uh, is hanging out with Michael Jordan, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, uh, Magic Johnson, uh, Larry Bird. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, he didn't play in the league. But these guys love your dad. Mm. So you, your dad must have been able to play. I mean, you don't get in the company of Sonny Rollins and Miles Davis just because they like you. Mm. Even musicians like myself, I'm not a star. But guys that are really close to me, I, there's something more going on. Mm. So my thing is, I said, I'm going to do this in a weird way with my dad in the saxophone case, because his horn, I'm going to go to these countries. Mm. And that, that was what I decided, you know. So these young people are going to have to figure out what they, what they really want to do with this music, because traveling around, meeting people like yourself and people that I've met, that is essential, man. Mm. I mean, this is a world music. Yes. As you know, you've met so many people that came through there. Mm. And uh, you meet them and they come and they go and sometimes they come back. 
Yeah. But it's like a great life. You say, oh, man, we had such a great time when you were here. Yeah. Can't wait to see you. Yeah. And um, that's going to be a problem with this COVID thing. Yes. I wish them the best on that because I've been to, I I would hate to say that if I never get to travel again, uh, would I be content? No. But I've been to quite a few countries, mm. and they know who Eric Wyatt is. Yeah. So whether they go online and follow me for the rest of my career or whatever. But I've been to from Australia to Malaysia to Shanghai to Prague to Bratislava to Canada to Germany to Italy. Uh, you know, it's 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 definitely necessary to play outside of the United States playing mm. this particular platform. So I don't know, man. Uh, but there's some good players. I'm leaving out a lot of names. There's a lot of great young people. Corey Wilcox, uh, Barry Stevenson, Keith Brown. So, the, oh, so, so the future is in good hands and with the talent. Yes. Yeah. The talent is not, yeah, not going to be a problem. Mm. It's, it's how is it going to be configured for the world to get to. Yeah. This is a world music. That's it. You know, one of the things that Sonny did have tell me you're gonna have to get outside of america to play mm. and that's just I, I mean i remember when i wasn't doing that and i saw a lot of guys that i was friends with doing it mm. but then i had the greatest break now this this is an ironic story i'm about to drop for you because you met the guy that got me my first gig outside of the united states and it was to a club called la villa in paris france and his name was carlos mckinney he played piano there Mm. With a girl, with a group from Detroit. Yeah, I think the girl name was Galen. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Carlos is her cousin or her brother. Okay. He was the guy who told this club owner about me in France, and I will never forget. It was in 1996, and he called me. Says, "Yo, man, this guy is going to bring you to play at this club in Paris." And I'm like, "What? <laughs> Get out of here!" <laughs> he says, "Nah, I gave him your phone number." He's going to call you. His name is Danny Michelle. Okay. And he was asking him about, there's a guy that was my mentor uh, in Brooklyn. I didn't speak on him. His name is Arthur Raines. And Arthur, I wrote a tune on that Sunny CD. It's on there called In the Spirit of Arthur. That's for Arthur. But Arthur was such a great musician who used to play with Wallace Roney. And Wallace would always talk about Arthur to anybody he could. And he was telling this club owner about Arthur Raines. So when Carlos heard him talk about it, he says, oh, that's my man. I got a friend who got recordings of that dude. He used to, he was his teacher. Somehow he said that club owner was like, I got to talk to this guy. One day uh, he calls uh, my sister because I wasn't living in my apartment. I was let my, my phone number go to my sister's calls. And my sister called my mom's. I called my mom's. He says, Oh, you need to call your sister. Some guy from Paris mm. is trying to bring you to play. I said, get out of here. And it was real. And I did go. I didn't go at that particular time. But um, it, that's important, man. Yeah. Just from the aspect of, of this particular style of music. Totally. So I hope the next generation, they'll be cool, but they got to really try to get outside of the United States. Yes, let's hope so. Yeah. Well, brother, that's all I've got for you for this afternoon or this evening. Okay. That's my okay. 10 questions. <laughs> I hope they were okay. All right. Thanks, Eric. Voodoo strikes. It'll tear apart your head when voodoo strikes. You wish that you was dead when voodoo strikes. It'll tear apart your head when voodoo